surging at historical levels and real wages being in the free fall throughout most of 2022, of course, intensifying human capital of the cost of living crisis risks to deepen economic scarring from the pandemic. At the beginning of 2023, now here in Davos, policymakers and business leaders face an array of challenging decisions to try and shield the most vulnerable in the short term to address some of the systemic drivers of worsening living standards and deepening inequality beyond 2023. So I am delighted to have on the panel today, Christian Lindner, he's Federal Minister of Finance for Germany, Gita Gopinath, International Monetary Fund, Alan Job, Chief Executive Officer of Unilever and Laura Tyson, Distinguished Professor of the Graduate School of Berkeley. So thank you all for joining us. This is not an easy topic, but it's one maybe that we need to spend a bit of time just to try and understand the underlying causes of inflation, the cost of living crisis. Gita, can you give us an overview of what you think? First of all, have we seen the worst in terms of inflation and the pressure this is putting and also these underlying causes? Yes, thank you. And it's a real pleasure to join this panel. As you said, it's a tough topic to talk about, but I think it's actually a little more easier to do so now than if we were having this conversation about six months back. <laughs> six months back, things were really mm -hmm. tough. Uh, inflation was at very high levels, especially headline inflation, which includes the cost of energy and the cost of food. Across the globe, we saw a global rise in inflation in the second half of uh, last year. And these two uh, factors were, were a big part of why we had this. Now we've seen energy costs come down quite significantly. We've seen food prices come down, but still remain elevated relative to before the pandemic. So actually I would make a distinction between what we're seeing in terms of energy markets versus in terms of food. I think in terms of food, we still have food security problems as a major concern, but we have inflation coming down. And so the cost of living has gone down over time. Now, what is tricky, of course, is that wages haven't kept up with the cost of living. So there's been a lot of erosion in uh, real wages. And you see the consequences of that this year. You can see unrest in different countries in the world and social unrest. So something we need to worry about. Would you like me to go into the factors behind this? Or would factors, you please, yeah. Okay, so in terms of the drivers for the big sp uh, spurge in inf inflation last year, I think I would start off by saying that we had a serious imbalance between demand and supply in several sectors. So for one, even before Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine, we had energy prices uh, going up. We had oil prices going up uh, quite sharply because we had a pretty strong recovery from the pandemic as a consequence of substantial stimulus that was provided, both in terms of monetary policy and fiscal policy to the world as a whole. So that generated a big uh, sharp increase in demand without the supply coming through very quickly. It was also a period when people were spending a lot on goods as opposed to services because the pandemic was not over and so people were still hesitant to go to restaurants. They were buying a lot of goods. And so we saw a global component of goods inflation rising uh, everywhere. And of course, following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we had a double knock on energy prices. It was different was really bad in parts of the world like Europe, where you had gas prices go up, uh, you know, three to four times. Uh, so these were several of the factors that drove the inflation. And of course, what's bringing it down now is the slowing global economy, which is coming from tight monetary policies in several parts of the world. But also we've been lucky with the milder weather. We also had 2022 as a year when China's demand for several of these commodities were actually low because they were still living under zero COVID policy. Several of those things can change this year, but let me stop there. Okay, uh, Minister, do you assume, thank you, Gita, do you assume that actually inflation will remain a high for a pretty long time? It's coming down, but it still remains high for, from historic levels. Well, we are witnessing uh, higher levels of inflation this year and the uh, outlook for the next year and uh, for 25 um, remains on a higher level than uh, we used uh, to see uh, in the past, but there is already a decline. Um, the uh, outlook, the economic outlook for Germany, for example, will be um, updated. At the moment, we expect uh, 7%. Um, I don't want to uh, spoil, but I expect um, um, 
a decline of the inflation rate. Uh, if you allow, I would like to to uh, underline one political aspect. We have heard the uh, economic assessment, uh, which I uh, fully share, um, but uh, we have to tell people and we have to tell low-income countries that one of the most important um, uh, reasons for the higher inflation rates is Russia's unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine. There are some narratives which uh, focuses the, uh, the sanctions uh, we uh, made decisions on, but the, the uh, key reason for higher inflation rates, for example, in the European Union, uh, is Russia's war. When it comes to Germany, if I may add, we have this uh, very strong uh, dependency, uh, especially on uh, Russian uh, energy imports um, in our domestic uh, market. Um, we were ridiculously uh, dependent on Russia. And now we are making efforts to overcome this situation. And I'm happy to tell you, um, we uh, built already two uh, LNG terminals uh, within uh, some months. And if you compare, the old German speed had been 20 years for one airport. <laughs> and right. now we are able to build LNG terminals in months. Yep. And so this very special situation um, poses an opportunity for Germany to improve our overall competitiveness by supply side measures. Laura, how difficult, thank you, Minister. Laura, how difficult is it to break down actually the causes of inflation? So how much of it is a war? How much of it is structural issues that have been here for quite some time? So I think that economists continue to debate this. And maybe Gita has the most recent uh, research. Uh, there, there is among economists the general view, well, how much of this was due to the fact that we uh, really pumped up demand to get quickly out of COVID and how much of that uh, was the fact that supply came back much more slowly than anticipated. So essentially the, the problem is it's demand supply. If you thought you were pumping up the demand, but you thought the supply would come back kind of normally, then you had all of these supply chain disruptions and you had logistic disruptions and you had uh, shipping disruptions. And so I, I don't think from my point of view that is, the most important question anymore. The, the question now is, what do we do going forward? What do we do going forward? We, we are where we are. I, I want to start with- But Laura, if you don't understand where it comes from, it's very difficult to- then It's demand and medicine. supply. So basically, you know, what's happening in the world is we've got the central banks pulling back on right. demand. We've got the developed economies and the developing economies pulling back on the fiscal stimulus. At, to the extent that they had one, pulling them back. So we're working on the demand side, and we actually are also working on the supply side. If I think about uh, the Biden administration, for example, it's done a lot on uh, opening up the ports. It's actually worked hard to get the logistics system back under uh, efficient, rapid recovery. It's done a lot in terms of uh, strategic use of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, actually putting oil in and now actually buying oil to put back into the system now that the price of energy has changed. So I think all I would say is rather than debate how much was demand versus how much was supply, let's say that both factors are there yeah. and that actually you have policymakers acting on both sets of factors. You, you actually yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, and I think that's important. And I just want to point out one a uh, positive issue here that hasn't been mentioned so far, and that is uh, inflationary expectations. Because part of the concern of the central bankers and the fiscal authorities, the macro authorities, and this would include the IMF, obviously, was once you let the inflation genie out of the bottle, you would end up with self-reinforcing mechanisms because as people expected structurally higher inflation, they would create structurally higher inflation. Um, and if you look at the medium to long-term measures of inflationary expectations, no. they suggest that people still expect, maybe not that the inflation rate 
will go quickly down to, in the U.S., the 2% target, but it might go reasonably quickly down to around 3%, which actually may end up being a place we can be for quite some time uh, in a healthy fashion. Um, Alan, what are you looking at Unilever? Is Unilever one of the biggest food companies in the world? You're dealing with inflation day in, day out, and you also have to make a decision on whether you pass that on to consumers. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think there's three enormous threats to our business, which is the climate emergency, uh, the loss and destruction of nature, and rising inequality. And the, it's the inequality uh, challenge that inflation is really amplifying uh, enormously. I think 75% of the world's population live in a country where the Gini coefficient over the last five years has got worse, the gap between rich and... And that's triggering, yes, a cost of living challenge, but also social unrest and anger. Um, I uh, humbly suggest, actually, the central banks and intergovernmental uh, bodies were very slow calling inflation. We could see it coming... Um, for quite some time before uh, it started to get called out. And maybe I just put some numbers against it. So yeah. Unilever revenues in 2021 were 52 billion euros. Uh, on that, we have a cost of goods sold of 24 billion euros. Um, and last year, we, we suffered 4.5 billion euros of cost inflation on a base of 24. So it's a very, very material, unprecedented uh, number. Nice. The last thing we want to do, the last thing we want to do is take prices up. Uh, it affects competitiveness. It, it disturbs volume in the market. So our first reflex is to go to uh, uh, productivity savings, change the mix in our business. Um, but ultimately, we did land price uh, last year. And the consumer did not react as we had anticipated. Um, there was a far lower volume elasticity than uh, we expected. And I think that was because of pent up uh, household savings that buffered uh, the consumer. Um, there was much less down trading than we expected to see. Uh, premium segments in most categories remain quite robust in food and healthcare and personal care. Um, and the world is not flat. We saw more of an effect in Europe, much less of an effect in particularly Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, places that are used to economic volatility stood up uh, very well. And our best read right now is that there's another two and a half billion euros of cost coming through in this calendar year. So um, I think um, the panelists are suggesting we may be past peak inflation. I think that's right. We are certainly nowhere close to peak prices. So the consumer is going to see the cost of sure. food, personal care products, of everyday commodities is going to continue to rise. And I think the, the most households, particularly in Europe, are going to feel the squeeze. Uh, Minister, do you, do you agree that we've reached peak inflation? And how long are you expecting the German government to continue to subsidize your citizens? Well, I, I hope so. Um, um, we presented a protective shield for our private households um, and um, uh, small and medium uh, enterprises. Uh, we um, um, have an uh, amount of up to 200 billion euros um, for 23 and 24 to pay uh, subsidies in uh, a form of um, uh, electricity price and gas price uh, break. But now, we already have to think about an exit. Uh, we uh, cannot uh, allow ourselves uh, to continue uh, to spend these amounts. Um, even um, Germany has its uh, budgetary uh, limits. And it's crucial to return to sustainable, to sound public finances on the one hand. Um, we mustn't further fuel inflation. And on the other hand, we have to to let the central banks uh, to do their work. They have a high responsibility for fighting inflation. And uh, I really um, welcome the change in monetary policy, which we have seen uh, last year. It's a journey uh, which has just uh, started, I think, and uh, we mustn't further fuel inflation. And uh, if I may, uh, we have to to work on the causes uh, for inflation. And domestically, it is the high energy price uh, level. On, on the European level, I think it's a lack of competitiveness as well.
Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about electricity prices. But if you look at the milder winter we've had, if you look at the price of gas that's gone down, will you, do you think you won't spend those two hundred billion? From my point of view today, we won't need 200 billion euros. Because it's getting easier. The price levels are um, um, lower than we expected. Uh, we have less hardship cases. And so my expectation is we won't need the uh, whole protective shield of 200 billion euros, which is good news because uh, German state is paying more uh, um, uh, for servicing uh, old debt. Yeah. Alan, you were nodding. No, I, um, I think there's one big unknown that uh, none of us would have predicted that China would be where they are right now uh, and that they would have... Uh, come out of COVID so extraordinarily quickly. There's two trillion of excess household savings in, uh, in China right now. Mm -hmm. And we fully expect, we're gearing up for revenge spending by Chinese households who have been locked down for three years. And that's gonna show up in travel, in domestic consumption. And I think that could be the disruptor that slows down the ending of inflation. That's a, a, very big variable in the supply and demand uh, construct. So I think that's one to watch carefully. Gita, is there a danger that we you know, are talking at cross purposes because inflation can come down, but for the people that have lost the most during the pandemic, the cost of living is very real and is not going anywhere? So indeed, you know, even if inflation comes down, prices are high because we don't have yeah. deflation. We, we just have uh, lower levels of inflation. So the prices have gone up. You know, how much of a hit that's had on households uh, and on consumption varies across countries. So, you know, in the US, for instance, there were, there was a lot of generous support provided to households during the pandemic. That meant that the savings of households have grown quite a bit. And in fact, there is still a fair bit of that excess savings left, uh, which is one possible upside to uh, spending and inflation that could happen. I think in the developing uh, parts of the world is where you really see the, the stress, which is, uh, you know, the cost of living has in, dented their incomes, and that's been a big uh, problem. So in terms of, you know, the point you raised about has inflation peaked, we do believe that in terms of headline inflation for the global economy, we think it peaked uh, in 22, uh, and it's likely to keep coming down. But if you look at the more stickier components of inflation, which is services sector inflation, for instance, I think there's more stubbornness in there. Uh, and that's going to be a, a challenge for central bankers. So, Gita, what do you see as a prolonged, I guess, cost, you know, the, the risks of a prolonged cost of living crisis for the most vulnerable groups, even if inflation comes down? I think there's a real risk here. Like I said at the beginning, I'm actually particularly worried about food security. Because we know that uh, you know food prices have come down, but they're still raw food prices have come down, but they're still about thirty percent above twenty nineteen levels, uh, and we know that the pass through from raw food prices to retail prices takes a while. So we haven't seen the effect yet, and we, we're likely to see retail price inflation in food you know going up in especially in, in the emerging developing world. Laura, how do you see this panning out? So if we have this cost of living crisis that is prolonged. That you know, what are the right policy mixes to address it, and what is the ultimate legacy of this? Well, I, I almost want to say that without calling it a cost of living in crisis, let's call it what existed before and is going to continue to exist, and that's a living wage crisis for many, many people. Uh, that is a living wage crisis in the United States, maybe for the bottom 20% of the population. It just has been. Uh, and if you look at in the U.S. where the th major components of uh, cost of living are food we've talked about, uh, gasoline, transportation we've talked about, but housing is the largest single one. And that was a cost of living crisis in the United States before. And it's going to be a cost of living crisis going forward. So I, I want to make that distinction here. When we're, the, the, the cost, the inflation... Uh, of these key areas of importance to cost of living has exacerbated what was a living wage or a poverty problem 
uh, throughout the world. And as Gita said, what we've seen is we've actually seen, instead of a reduction in people living in poverty, we've seen an increase in the level of people living in poverty. We've seen a worsening of the Gini coefficient. Uh, but it, it's, so it's exacerbated a problem which existed before and which we have not solved. Minister, you live this day and day out. I mean, housing in Germany is a concern. It's becoming less affordable, especially for young families. What are some of the things that you have introduced or can introduce to make it easier? Well, um, to reduce housing costs, we need to build. And this means we need um, uh, public um, uh, funding and uh, subsidies, especially for uh, poorer families and vulnerable households on the one hand. And on the other hand, we need more effective, less bureaucratic permitting procedures in Germany. This is the problem of Germany. We have private sector capital, we have know-how, and we have um, interested uh, companies and investors, but it takes, it took too long time. We are working uh, on it. <laughs> And um, may I ask, um, or may I add one aspect? Um, the special situation in, in Germany is that we are, at the moment, uh, we are losing collective welfare due to the higher prices for energy imports. Okay. The German business model for too long time based on very cheap energy imports. And this is why we could afford a higher level of taxation, for example. Uh -huh. And now we have to reinvent our business model. And uh, my expectation is uh, higher competitiveness for the German private sector right. will lead to the ability to pay higher wages mm -hmm. to reduce the burden for the private I households see. by paying uh, better loans and wages. Minister, there has also been suggested for that real estate company, BIMA, Right, should take out loans and build state housing. Is it no, something no. that you rule out? I mean, no, something that's talked I won't, about. I won't allow this. <laughs> uh, BIMA is um, yeah, the um, uh, state driven um, uh, public uh, sector company. It builds um, the buildings for ministries and um, um, military uh, areas. It's not for, for uh, families and people. Um, that's clear. Laura, what, um, Alan, you had something to add. Well, I just wanted to pick up on what Laura was saying about uh, this idea of a living wage. Uh, the reason why I frame my opening remarks in the context of rising inequality yeah. is that this is a long-term trend. It's not a short-term cost of living crisis. It's a long-term inequality crisis. Mm -hmm. And there's a concept of a fair living wage, which is paying people enough to feed house, clothe, and educate themselves, in some cases, transport as well. And at, you know, even over four years ago, we said, well, of course, well-run company, we, um, we must pay all of our people a fair living wage. So we started, well, what is a fair living wage? And um, there's multiple standards. So we picked a standard and we looked ourselves in the mirror. It turned out there were pockets of the world where we were not paying a fair living wage. We got busy with that. We've now rectified that. Everyone who works for Unilever makes a fair living wage. We've now said everyone who provides products and services to Unilever will pay their employees a fair living wage by 2030. And, that, and we've got 93 of our suppliers have signed up right away hmm. to pay their, and so that amplifies us from an impact of hundreds of thousands of people to millions of people. And this is not charity. People who are paid properly are less likely, you get lower attrition, you get higher productivity, you get better motivation. It is a strong financial incentive to pay people proper properly. And so I would ask all the business leaders in the room um, and the regulators in the room to consider if fair living wage is an opportunity for your business, because we shouldn't be running our economies and running our businesses on slave wages, poverty wages. Um, so I think there's a call to action here to pay people properly. Alan, the last 12 months, have you increased wages to match inflation? So 8-10% increases? It's very different in different parts of the world. So our, our global wage bill uh, will be just slightly lower than inflation for 2022, same in 2023, um, uh, but enormous differences in different countries around the world. Minister? Um, 
I completely understand and share your concern um, when it comes to inequality. And we have to support the most vulnerable in our societies. But, well, I would like to focus on our middle classes, um, people who were able to afford, who were able to afford a standard of living, um, who were able to afford their own properties. And for them, the situation is changing. They now can't afford the cost of living and they can't reach their own properties. And so mm -hmm. in the German and probably European perspective, we are doing a lot for the most vulnerable, paying uh, welfare subsidies. But we have to ask, what can we do to stabilize the qualified people who are working hard, playing by the rules, and now are witnessing that they can't afford their lifestyle, the way of living they have learned from uh, their parents, for example. And this leads to, well, um, a, a renaissance of, of competitiveness so that our companies are able to pay fair wages and lead to a new financial surrounding so that those people can afford loans and mortgages for their properties. So, Laura, what, I mean, given what the minister and Alan and Geet have just said, what's the right policy mix to deal with this? Right policy mix. Well, I uh, indicated that I th thought at the beginning, this is not, these are not traditional macro demand and monetary policy. So you have to go into the, from a federal point of view or a state, I do a lot of work for the state of California, which is a big economy. Um, at that, you look at the composition of the budget in terms of what you're spending money on, and you look at composition of the revenue stream in, in terms of what you are taxing, what you can bring in to support the spending on the budget side. Uh, because we're not talking about major deficit reduction or deficit enhancing spending. So in this case, I would say, uh, if you, if you think about um, what the federal government of the United States has done, we've said long term, uh, how can we get at more affordable cost of living, more affordable uh, cost of living? Uh, one is to work on improving logistics infrastructure. I mentioned ports. Uh, a part of the problem here, uh, certainly through COVID and the supply chain and the slow recovery on the supply side was logistics issues. And so the bipartisan infrastructure bill has a lot in that area. Another area, of course, obviously is climate and trying to deal with the reality that over time we're going to have to tr do energy transition away from carbon-based fuels to other kinds of fuels. And if we can give tax incentives, and there are many, many tax incentives in our uh, IRA bill, to basically reduce the cost to a consumer of buying an electric car or of using all kinds of, if we think about the goal here for climate of electrifying everything, we've put tax credits in for everything to electrify, to try to get people cheaper access to the electrification faster. So those are a couple of examples where it's working on the supply side where you think policy can actually encourage more supply. You know, on climate, just let me mention, and I know this is true around the world, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the private sector with improving agricultural techniques, whether it's how you seed, how you irrigate, how you harvest, uh, to improve the efficiency of that, and over time to reduce the cost of food through improving the technologies. So there's a lot of that I think is in the area of enhancing technological development uh, to deal with sectors. I wanna say that, that housing is the most complicated, and it's the most complicated because there are resistance to the use of land for this purpose. So you talked, Minister, about the difficulty of getting zoning. You know, California, we have a huge housing crisis. It has been recognized by the federal level uh, for years. Most of those zoning laws are made 
at the local level, and most localities do not want to build additional housing. They don't want the drain on the education system, on the healthcare system, on the transportation system, on the park system, on nothing. And therefore, this is going to be, to some extent, one of the hardest nuts to crack. Policymakers are having a really hard time with this. Getting people behind them. Gita. <laughs> so just make a couple of points. So firstly, since there's been a focus on the more secular features of the cost of living, I think we should agree that if we can bring inflation down from 10% to 2%, we would be much happier. I think we, start, we live with 2% inflation in many parts of the world for a very long time. If we can bring inflation durably down to that level, I think that Completely would be success. Agree. And macro policies, Laura, I agree with you, the supply side measures play an important role, but macro policies are going to be critical to that. So I think it's very important for inflation aggregate demand relative to supply depends upon monetary policy stance and fiscal policy stance. Yep. And therefore it's very important to stay the course, bring inflation down uh, durably. The second thing, and I think, uh, you know, Alan's point was, uh, you know, we saw inflation coming sooner if you looked at food and if you looked at those uh, sectoral products, especially food, uh, relative to, say, central bankers did. And I think this is a lesson to be learned from these last couple of years, which is the central bank thinking, monetary policy thinking, was that you kind of could ignore sectoral price movements. Mm. If you see big movements in sectoral prices, you could uh, see through that because those things tend to be very volatile. Monetary policy works with lags. Mm. So you don't want to rush in and raise interest rates because you saw food prices go up by uh, 20%. I think what we've learned in the last two years is that when you are in a world where you have demand coming back strongly and you have sectoral supply shocks hitting at several margins, uh, in that case, you really can't see through <laughs> sectoral supply shocks. So I think that's the lesson we've learned. And it's something we have to keep in mind because we're not out of the woods when it comes to supply shocks. We still have a climate transition that has to happen. We have to make sure we have... Uh, secure energy. We still have China that's coming back. And I agree with you. Yeah. One of the risks to uh, inflation uh, going up is how strong the rebound will be in China. I mean, right now there's a bit of a disconnect between the markets and what central banks have been communicating with. The markets expect that we're heading towards the 2% target really quickly in the US and the Fed will be there to, rate, to cut interest rates very soon. Uh -uh. Again, you have to keep in mind that there are all these uncertainties around the world including what will happen to energy prices uh, as, other as the Chinese economy comes, uh, comes up. So we have to stay, stay the course. The second thing I would uh, make in terms of the, the more structural side of inflation is it is important for countries to diversify the sources of uh, uh, where they buy goods from. Uh, heavy reliance on only one country we know, Germany has that experience can create a lot of trouble. And so diversification is very important. But the answer is certainly not to bring all your production home, which is <laughs> yeah. a risk that we see. Yeah. And it is a, a significant mm. risk to the global economy. The reason we had three decades of being able to keep inflation down was because we, we, were, uh, yeah. we had trade with many countries in the world. That put cost pressures yeah. down for households and for firms. Uh, but I see the tendency now in response to the pandemic and the war to go maybe the other extreme and to say the only solution is for us to do everything in-house. And that is the perfect recipe for us to live with high inflationary pressures for a long time. Mm. But Gita, on the monetary policy point, is there a danger that so we go from inflation 8% to 4%, 5%, and actually central banks will have to put a lot of economies in a recession, we'll see job losses, and so the cost of living crisis will get worse to get to that 2% target? You know, we haven't seen the softening in the job market that we typically see going around with the big increase in, in interest rates. So when we say that 2023 is going to be a tough year and tough of several economies compared to last year, it is because the labor market is where we are likely to see uh, unemployment rates go up. We're at record low unemployment rates in the US and in the Euro area, record lows, right? Everything we know about how monetary policy works when you've tightened interest rates so much is for the unemployment rate to go up. That's how you bring down inflation durably. Question is how much will it take? Um, but at this point, there's really only one way for it to go. Mm -hmm. Minister, what are you gonna do for that middle class? 
that you say is being squeezed so much? I mean, do we need to reform the electricity market? Yes, we have to reform the electricity market. We have to reduce, reduce the uh, burdens, uh, for example, in the um, uh, taxation. Uh, we have to, to um, uh, improve the uh, framework conditions for our SMEs in Germany and all this supply side uh, measures. And this is crucial. Um, I remind us of Joe Biden here in Davos, 2000, I think, 17, when he um, delivered a speech um, concerning um, um, the, the American middle class. Uh -huh. And yeah. um, um, he warned that if we forget them, they would forget us, the elites, and they, are, they were probably looking uh, for other representatives. And uh, afterwards, uh, we, we saw what happened in the US. If I may, um, there's uh, one very interesting uh, aspect uh, you mentioned, the um, serious risk of uh, fragmentation of the global economy. Um, mm -hmm. We see protectionism. I have my concerns with the Inflation Reduction Act. Everyone, yes, the European. And um, we need to, to have the, 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 the right consequences um, in this um, situation of, of supply chain bottlenecks, inflation. Um, there are some, some criticisms about uh, globalization. And I think mm, at the moment we have a period of opportunity, a window of opportunity. Russia's war against Ukraine brought us as value partners together. Mm -hmm. And um, we were able on the G7 level under the German presidency last year to found a climate club. I think this is uh, um, an uh, impressive example of policy making power. And so why stopping there? We should continue these efforts. Instead of having, well, kind of a trade controversy between the US and the uh, European Union, we should consider whether there is uh, an opportunity for French shoring, as um, my US colleague Janet uh, Yellen um, uh, um, suggested. So um, we should have a different level of ambition. Uh, why not starting to negotiate no. a global trade agreement uh, of the liberal democracies? But Minister, it could also, and I know a number of European leaders have voiced concerns about this Inflation Reduction Act. Could Europe not yes. do its own IRA? No, we mustn't. A competition who is able to pay more subsidies um, uh, would... Um, 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 be a threat to sustainable public finances in Europe. And um, frankly, the, our next generation EU fund uh, is about 800 billion euros in comparison to the IRI. I think we are doing a lot. So it's not trade war, no. it's trade diplomacy we need. Um, Laura, and actually the same question to all of you. Are you optimistic that the cost of living crisis will get better or does it have, to, or will it get worse before then it eases off a bit? Well, I, th I think the question is si similar to will the inflation rate, uh, have we seen a peak inflation rate? And I think we have. I think we're going to, I think traditional monetary policy and fiscal policy is going to continue to battle to bring it down. I think it is true and unfortunate that the, the only way that monetary policy and fiscal policy does that is to create slack in the labor market. That's what it does. Uh, what, what one hopes is that the unemployment rate doesn't go up too much, that that relationship between the ability of monetary policy to bring the inflation rate down and how much you have to rely on that unemployment rate going up, that that relationship is different now. And that's, I know, what Jerome Powell and the Fed is hoping. Um, but I think that uh, we, are go we are on a course to bring the inflation rate down. Uh, and and I, I just want to say, because I don't want this to be a... a a debate about between the US and Europe. But what I what I really think we need is exactly cooperate. Much of the IRA is about climate. 
And what we need to do is we need to work together to basically use subsidies and tax policy to accelerate the speed, to accelerate and scale uh, all of the technology requirements yeah. to address climate change. That's what we need to do. And but we have to we mitigate the negative side effects on partners. I would suggest. No, 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 no. I'm saying, I'm saying, if we think about that as a general goal, we should be able to structure the policy so as to mitigate those effects. But you know, you're a political, <laughs> you are uh, appointed by politics. Um, it is very hard to do this. You're spending national resources, your country's resources, and the politics of the Congress. Uh, led very much, in particular, a couple senators led very much to the writing of that piece of legislation. Alan, better or worse? I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic um, because the cost of living crisis disproportionately impacts those at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, there is so much talk about tightening rates and about uh, stimulus spending. I think the only way to break the long-term trend of rising inequality is productivity. I think the minister's right. No. Okay. You know, ultimate productivity, no one's talking about productivity as a sustainable way out of uh, the inflation environment that we're in right now. I think the private sector's got quite a lot to offer on uh, how you tackle productivity, but I just think it's gonna take time and uh, the, the people who are suffering the most will continue to suffer for quite a long time. And this fragmentation of global supply chains and nearshoring, onshoring, friendshoring, whatever you call it, is frankly another inflationary pressure in the world economy. Gita? Mm -hmm. So um, if our projections are right, we do have inflation coming down globally this year and next. Uh, of course, uh, we've been surprised many times. And I think, uh, you know, <laughs> last year at this time, nobody expected uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, so that happens. So things can go terribly wrong, but the baseline is for inflation to come down and come down across the globe. I think that will help with cost of living. I think the perennial problems of inequality and those at the bottom and the issues in housing will remain. I think there's a harder nuts to crack and those that will uh, take some more time. But I think we should be, you know, feel good about the fact if inflation comes, comes back down to the, to the more reasonable levels. On fragmentation, I'm going to put my global hat on and say we really want all countries to be able to work together to come up with solutions and mm -hmm. maybe putting my completely pragmatic hat on, I would say at least at the minimum when it comes to things like food exports, exports of fertilizers, uh, basic essentials for the world that we have multilateral solutions and not friend solutions or any. insuring or outsuring or any of those combinations <laughs> of that. Thank you, Minister. Very Does good. it get worse or easier the cost of living crisis from here? The German media reports that there's a lot of pessimism here in Davos. Um, I think we should change the perspective from doubts and concerns to opportunities and challenges. We are not objects of our fate. Uh, we are not passengers of uh, the flight, we are pilots. And so let's work on policy solutions for the challenges we have to cope with. And you see the willingness of, of government leaders and politicians to come together and find a common solution? Well, within the um, European Union, among the member states, there is uh, the willingness to do. And uh, we are making efforts, for example, uh, to deepening um, our single market and to make progress on capital markets uh, union. Uh, so um, there is a reason for optimism. Okay, well, thank you all for um, a, a very interesting panel. Kristen Lindner, Alan Job, Gita Gopinath, and Laura Tyson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I did not know about you.